Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. There we go. Had my guy in, but I didn't have myself in. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon Live. The Comic Book Conversation Show. John Suntress here. Very happy to welcome Jeff Lemire back to Word Balloon. It's been a while, but he's been very busy. Uh, not only in the comic book world, but the television world as well. Congratulations on uh, everything that's been going great for you the last few years, Jeff. Well done. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, it's been it's been good. It's been exciting. You know, considering everything else going on in the world, it's nice that I've had my work to kind of keep me sane. So, yeah, definitely. Well, we got some new comic books to talk about, but for yeah. a second, let's talk TV and, um, you know, how, how, uh, how well was uh, Sweet Tooth received? Yeah, no, it seemed to go over really big. I mean, uh, I think it was, it's up there in the top 10 Netflix most huge shows now or something. So um seemed to go over really well. You know, obviously the, the tone of the show was a bit more family friendly than, than the book, which, which is fine. You know, I think they comp complement each other fairly well and, but yeah, it seemed to go over well, and the, certainly a lot of people seem to come to the comic because of the show, which is what you hope for, you know, when these things happen, that you can maybe reach some people who would normally not go to a comic store or read one of your books, and uh, that certainly seems to have happened, so that's that's great, and they're, they're shooting season two right now, so. That's fantastic, man. Uh, oh, here, let's see here. Uh, Deviant uh, Borg is uh, saying hi to us and everything, but very cool, and happy to see that you're on the show. Excellent. Uh, that's okay. He misspelled John. Don't worry about it, Deviant. It's all right, man. And uh, you were just telling me off the air, Essex County coming up. Uh, yeah, we're getting television. ready to prep shoot that. That's wow. uh, shooting August, September. So um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really busy right now rewriting scripts and uh, casting and all that cool stuff. So, um, yeah, it's been a long process in that one. We've been developing the show for, I think, six years. And there were times where I didn't think it was really going to happen, but it seems like it's it's happening in a couple months so uh it's good it's been uh, a lot of hard work but hopefully you know it all pays off now it'll be fun to do it for sure any name actors uh attached to the project that we know not yet we're just starting the process so yeah we're okay just, the kind of conversations we're having with people and um nothing yet i can announce though will it will it also be on netflix or will it have a different home so it's going to start on uh, the CBC in Canada, and then there will be an American broadcast partner, but we're still not haven't decided on on who yet. So that's all that's all stuff that's still still in development for sure. Understood, man. Very cool. That's great. Well, in the meantime, we've got excellent uh, Lemire uh, comics to uh, keep us warm, and uh, uh, certainly excited about the last days of Black Hammer which is a long time coming to go back right to uh, the beginnings of black hammer and everything yeah. and really look at them in their prime, the, the team. Yeah, it's fun. It's uh, it's kind of weird. I'm, I'm doing, I'm writing simultaneously kind of writing the first and last black hammer stories. Now this is this, even though it's called the last days of black, Hammer, it's actually sort of a prequel to the, to the series that everyone's been reading for the last yeah. years, you know, it, it kind of goes back to when, when black hammer himself was still alive and well, and kind of in his prime as the main superhero of that universe, you know, so you get to see his, some of that, which we only get glimpses of really um, here and there throughout the, the original series. Um, and then at the same time, I'm kind of writing what, what I'm kind of billing as the final black hammer series, at least for now, uh, which will, Black Hammer Reborn is winding up and then it'll launch into this final kind of mini series that wraps up what we've been doing for the last few years. And, and then from there, we'll see what happens, but I'm probably going to let it rest for a year or two. Okay, dude, what a great series, truly top to bottom. Uh, so, so much fun and really uh, a marriage of both uh, your work in at the big two and also your, just your general sensibility and obviously it being your own thing. You could really make it more idiosyncratic and weird in, in the best ways as you yeah. have with Black Hammer. And I've even loved the crossovers, uh, like from a couple of years ago when you had them uh, crossover with the Justice League and everything. And you really it's it's just great to kind of see the the mirror, the reverse image of, of you know, uh, what what a superhero team is 
uh, in both traditional and the Lemire verse. So I, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that, it's been fun. I've gotten to do more with that world that I ever imagined. Obviously, you know, I, I originally just conceived it as um, just the original series, the original sort of main storyline, and it kind of over the years just grew and grew and we were given other opportunities to do these other stories and build like an entire universe out of it. So um, yeah, it was kind of, it's all been sort of gravy now beyond my wildest dreams of what I could have done with that. And uh, I've, I've loved every minute of sort of telling all those superhero stories. I always dreamed of telling the way, the way I wanted to tell them, you know, um, it was very, uh, very fun and, and really exciting to work with so many different artists and yeah, it's been great. And also, uh, occasion like uh, you know, you had a few people, a few other writers, kind of playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've tried, most of it's me, but you know, uh, yeah. there's been a couple books here and there where I brought in some friends of mine. I've got, you know, it, that's the best part of what I get to do is working with my friends when I can. And so, you know, I, yeah, some some people have come in and done some stuff. You know, Matt Kent and Ray Fox and and a young writer named Tate Bromble, who's sort of up and coming. I've been kind of helping him out and he he did some great stuff for me so and he's going to do some stuff on my sub stack with black hammer this week starting so um yeah it's been great great to work with friends and and help build this these things we love together is is the best how has the sub stack experience been for you uh it's good it's you know really positive it's a lot of work to be honest more <laughs> but you yeah. know it, you got to do a lot of prep and have a lot of material obviously for it so I did a lot of work in the summer before I launched just to kind of get as far ahead and stock up on posts and, and material to use, you know, and, and once it gets rolling, it really, it really rolls, it's, you know, twice a week or whatever. So, uh, but, you know, I, I do love the direct, the direct line to the readers, you know, especially the most dedicated readers who, who are willing to pay for the extra material and stuff and you want to reward them. So you start to feel a bond with those people that you don't, especially during the pandemic, we couldn't do, conventions and stuff so you kind of miss that aspect the one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction with with your readers you know I, I hadn't had that and this obviously isn't direct interaction but it's it's a, the next best thing you know where you're kind of yeah. communicating directly with them so it's been cool i've really liked it really enjoyed it uh john wants to know if you can tease any upcoming substack projects um let me think there's well the big one there's a big one that's going to drop on well, I think tomorrow, actually, we haven't announced it or anything. It's just going to kind of go. So that keep an eye tomorrow. There's a there's a big one coming that um, with a lot of cool artists involved. Uh, there's about a half a dozen at least different artists working on it with me, including Sorrentino. So it's uh, <clears throat> that'll be fun. And beyond that, we'll see. I'm I'm kind of I've got the next two or three, I guess, two months plotted out for the sub stack. And then after that, uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what I come up with. OK. Uh, Mateo wants to know if the uh, Justice League Black Hammer arc will be collected in a World of Black Hammer hardcover or only in the standalone edition. I think that one will only be standalone for now. But, you know, it's something to do with all the contracts between Dark Horse and DC and stuff of what they can do and whatnot. So, but that was the only standalone story that got a hardcover right away. So it won't be in a library, but at least we got a hardcover of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, Nico wants to know, with all the movement around your work, do you still feel best when sitting at the drawing table and writing and drawing your own books like Fraud Catchers? Yes, I do. Yeah, it's really even more and more as I get older, too. I, I kind of want to go back to where I started when I was just one, working on one book at a time and I was just <laughs> by myself doing my thing. So I still do that most days, but um, obviously there's so many other projects going. You're kind of juggling stuff and... Um, I think as I as I get older and the next stage of my career, I'll probably be shrinking down a bit and not doing as much stuff and just sort of focusing on one thing and being a cartoonist again. You know, I've kind of I've done enough over the last 10 or 15 years that I can afford to do that again. So that'll be good. You always find great uh, creators to artists to to collaborate with. Uh, it, there really is, though, something when it is just you writing and drawing and and that uh, i mean a lot of your stuff has that ennui and that you know we're going to talk about two of the new books that are collaborative and everything and they they got that lemire like i'm, I'm glad i read them during the daylight that's all i can say man <laughs> and it's great because truly jeff i don't mean that you know this isn't like a backhanded comment no, uh, compliment 
But you know, honestly, obviously, man, there's a, there's, a, there's some dire stuff in there, which is great. I mean, you you move the reader, and and it's great, and and truly, just your. I mean, I, I've told you a million times when we talk, just you know, sweet tooth, and God, that poor kid. I mean, you just looking at that face, you're just like, oh, oh, God, you know, like, can you have a happy story with them? That's why, as you said, you had to make the the TV show a little more family friendly and stuff. But I'm really excited. Uh, again, going back, as you say, uh, to your beginnings, you know, we discovered you, me, and uh, the Around Comics guys uh, with Essex County. And it's just. Yeah, you were probably, you and those guys were probably the two first sort of, you know, like interview sort of things I ever did in comics. So, yeah, back to that. So, you know, I always try to have one project going that kind of is in that world or in, the, you know, and uh, it kind of keeps me sane when all the other stuff gets busy. So I do try to, you know, most mornings I, I'm still drawing my own thing. And, that kind of anchors everything else, which is nice. That's excellent, man. Now, I'm glad uh, Deanie Dude wants to talk because I was at the comic store the other day and I was looking at uh, your uh, your maze book oh, yeah. uh, layouts and everything. So, yeah, if uh, you can, he wants to hear about the painting and layout process for maze book. He was yeah. some of those pages. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I love that. Was, it's one of my favorite books. I've One of the most enjoyable projects I've done in that book. Um, and yeah, as soon as I had that idea of, the, of, the, of, you know, the story about puzzles and mazes and things, I just saw the, there's such a graphic potential for a maze with comic book storytelling and doing some cool layout stuff, you know, so I didn't want to let that go. Uh, so I really spent some time playing around with what I could do. And I think the, the biggest sequence was when he enters the maze and uh, all the pages connect. So if you were to take them out of your book and lay them out on the ground, it would actually form a big maze thing and that was so hard to, to do it forever as you can imagine a lot of you know preliminary drawing and and uh, i literally having stuff just these big sheets of paper on my floor here in my studio um you know <laughs> laying out and map mapping the layout in different different stages so that by the time you got to drawing the final art that all that work was done and you could just you know focus on the details but um yeah, so it was it was fun to do that one for sure. And then, you know, the painting process is really just it's all pen and ink. And then uh, oh, my drawing boards right behind me over this, this shoulder here. Uh, it's all pen and ink. And then uh, just I use one watercolor as a wash. Uh, and it's pretty a pretty simple process. All hand drawn. Yeah. It reminded me of when J.H. Uh, Williams and Alan Moore did Promethea and they had that one. Uh that one issue that kind of, you know, it all came together in the same way and everything. Although not yeah, JH is always one you look at for layouts, right? Uh, him and Sorrentino too. They're both so inventive, especially yes. double spreads and things. They're always pushing, pushing things. And uh, JH is new book. I can't, what's it called? The, his new image series. Oh, shame on me. Yeah. I, I forget too. Oh, yeah. I to talk I to you. It's, it's a beautiful. And I, I of course it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. He's always pushing that stuff, right? And uh, those guys are inspiring. You read those things and you want to try stuff out. And, uh, yeah, so those are two touchstones for sure. All right, we're going to get to you and uh, Sorrentino's uh, latest with uh, Passage in a second, but I want to get Echo one Lands. more. Wait, Echo Lands. That's the uh, G.H. Oh. Williams book, I think. Am I remembering? I okay. Started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, well done. Attaboy. Very good. Nico wants to know if you could speak about your experiences working with Gabriel Walta on Sension. And again, another incredible, beautiful book. Absolutely, man. You find these uh, wonderful people to collaborate with. And like I said, your voice comes through, but mm -hmm. it does become a different thing with a different artist. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I worked with a ton of artists, and you know, when I was at Marvel and DC, especially you're, you go through the monthly grind on a number of books, you're going to be put with a whole bunch of people. And sometimes you'll find one like uh, Sorrentino or Dustin. And then with Gabriel, again, where it just clicks and it's like... Uh, you know, they're not exactly my style, but of when I draw my own stuff, but they, they, they capture some part of it and they, or, and together we become like a third creator. That's, you know, something different. Yeah. Uh, I think with Dustin and I do that and Sorrentino and, and I found that with, uh, with Gabriel too, it's a very rare that you find those collaborations, you know? So when, when we, as soon as we did uh, that sentient book, we knew we had something to cook and, you know, and we, we've, started working on a new series for image that will launch in the fall. Um, we haven't announced any details yet, but yeah, he's, he's on the second issue now. And it's, it's, uh, I love working with him. Again, his storytelling is very uh, similar to mine in that it's very widescreen panels, very cinematic. And, and I feel like I can really communicate 
really well with him uh, in different ways than I do with Dustin and Andrea, because you don't want to just do the same book. You know what I mean? You want, yeah. if I'm going to do different books, they should all be, uh, have a different feeling. And I think Gabriel and I have a, a good thing going. So yeah, he, it was really fun to do that. That uh, sentient book was all done for me really quickly. I had the, the concept was given to me and I, I wrote the six issues in probably about under two months because I was <laughs> I was super busy and uh, so it all just kind of poured out fast and uh, kind of from the gut, which is how I tend to draw or tend to write anyway. Just sort of I don't overthink it. Uh, and and Gabriel was so good at bringing those characters to life, those kids, uh, and giving it so much heart. So yeah, he was he's wonderful to work. So you're um, a new new project with Gabriel for Image. Are yeah. you entering into an exclusive period with Image? Yeah, I did. I signed an exclusive, uh, sort of like the one that Brubaker signed a few years ago. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm I'm going to be exclusive with Image for next few years with all my publishing. You know, I'll, I'll do stuff on Substack as well, but that will all end end up in print at Image. Uh, okay. Yeah. And it all coincided with the, me winding down the Black Hammer stuff this year anyway so i'll have an exemption to finish up the black hammer stuff and i okay. wanted to let that universe sit for a bit before i did anything new with it anyway so it, it was a good opportunity for me just to go all in at image for a while and especially with all the tv stuff going on when you don't have to worry about who's going to publish your book and stuff like that for a couple of years it, it, it kind of takes that off my plate so it just seemed like a good time yeah so i'll have those you know i'll be doing stuff with dustin we have the big thing with sartino i'm sure we'll talk about and uh yeah and then the oh, game okay. book, yeah. And this okay. Is, yeah. Well, yeah. Let's get into it now. When uh, Sorrentino, you guys are uh, doing the passageway, mm -hmm. and um, this is part of what you call, and I don't want to get the name wrong. Echo Mountain. Uh, your yes, your Bone Orchard Mythos. Yeah. Say it, say bone, it again. The Bone Orchard Mythos. Bone. There you go. Yes. Excuse yeah. me. That's uh, right. Yes. The so what uh, you know is is that like your Twilight Zone basically? I mean, how do you? Yeah. Uh, you know. It kind of evolved. We finished Gideon Falls, you know, and we yes. wanted, wanted to keep working together, obviously. Uh, and um, we did Primordial, the sci-fi story, as quite a, kind of a palate cleanser from all the horror stuff from Gideon. You know, we thought we'd do something different. And when we were working on that, we started talking about what to do, what we wanted to do next. And Andrea expressed a, a desire to do, um, instead of just doing one big, long series again, to try to do some different stories, smaller self-contained stories. Um, so he could try different things and we could just creatively stay fresh and not get stuck in the same world with the same characters for three, four years, you know? Uh, so that was how it started. And then once we kind of talked more about what the kinds of stories he wanted to do, which all tended to be darker edge stories or horror stories, which suit his art style so well. Um, then the conversation turned to, well, what if we did a bunch of short, self-contained stories but what if they were all connected and what if they shared the same mythology under underneath it all you know so um kind of like lovecraft's books you know they a lot of them are individual stories but they all kind of have that same lovecraftian mythology underneath them you know or um uh so we that was where it came from and then we decided well, yeah let's do this thing where each year we put out two or three different books that can be read by themselves, but we're also building this huge story, this huge mythology that we created. So that's what that is. And this um, passageway is the first, the first story in that world. It's it's a hardcover comes out right as a hardcover graphic novel, you know, um, in May. And then uh, the next one will be a comic book miniseries, a five issue series in in September. So we're going to play with different formats and different story lengths, whatever suits each story. But eventually, they'll all be collected in a unified sort of library and uh, and, and tell a much bigger, more ambitious story. So it's, yeah, it's something we're going to work on over the. You know, we're we're already planning the third year of this thing, and we haven't launched the first year yet. So it's going to be a pretty sprawling. Uh, project for sure something that it's a real playground for us to kind of do whatever we want passageway uh takes place uh on a coast right by a lighthouse and it's uh, this great kind of horror story and uh i felt the chill as i was reading it because of sorrentino's uh art it really uh it really sucked you into the atmosphere of the story and um yeah I, what else can i say i mean without without spoiling much you you describe what you want to about passageway yeah, I mean, it's a great standalone graphic novel. It tells the story of a geologist who's called to a remote 
island with a lighthouse and there's a there's a strange sinkhole that's appeared in the lighthouse which doesn't seem to make geological sense uh and the the guy and the this this kind of eccentric lighthouse keeper kind of start looking and investigating this this thing and it it ends up being quite literally a passageway into this bigger mythology that andrea and i are creating but also a passageway into some some repressed memories this guy has been carrying that have kind of been haunting him you know very personal story as well so it kind of does both things of telling this one emotionally driven kind of story of this man and this kind of dark odyssey into his past but also like i said just sort of show you the tip of the iceberg of of what this bone orchard is going to going to be when, when we start rolling with it um yeah, so it's fun, and I, I'm a sucker for lighthouse stories. I, I'll, I'll see, read, or see anything about a lighthouse. I don't, maybe it's because I just want to live in one by myself. I don't know. <laughs> also, there's a there's a childhood uh, toy that's almost a totem in the story. Yeah, and dude, I wonder sometimes if, for inspiration, you're either going through an, an old toy box, or if you're <laughs> walk walking through a junkyard or a land, like I hate to say, it, a landfill or something like that, because I love how specific uh the drawing that sorrentino does of this toy and it just is like oh man like yeah. it's so like i literally it, it took me to like walking by i don't know even like a like a garbage uh tip or whatever with you know a, an old toy sitting there it's just that's it was cool. beautiful yeah see that's that's i mean i don't even know how specific i was in the script for that toy so that's andrea bringing something real to that he must have really done some le some legitimate research on old old toys and uh found something because it does feel like you said it feels like something you'd see on the ground it's uh so yeah that's the joy of working with him he brings such specificity and to things but he also does these sprawling kind of expansive imaginative layouts and storytelling things that that are kind of uh, they transcend what I write in the scripts. They kind of push it to another level. So I love, I love that. And it's it's always interesting in different stories. Going back to your Green Arrow run and uh, Gideon Falls, and now this. Yeah, that's the joy of this new universe too. Is that even though they're all technically horror stories, that I mean, horror can mean a lot of different things, right? It can be, and it can cross over into a lot of different genres, even. So it gives us the freedom to kind of really go all over the place and uh, tell different kinds of stories. Um, and yeah, so they won't all be contemporary. They won't all be set, you know, uh, on earth, even there's going to be crazy stuff. It's going to, this, this mythology that we've worked out spans all of history from the beginning of creation to the far future. And it, it's kind of limitless and, you know, it's going to be fun. We're going to have a good time. That's great, man. No, that's fantastic. And truly the, the mysteries that you, lay out in the passage that certainly aren't explained in this first graphic novel. It's uh, I, I do think the, the, the people that love Gideon falls and the like are certainly going to be very comfortable in this, uh, in this world. So. That's good. Yeah. It definitely, if you, if you like Gideon falls, this is going to be definitely our follow up to that and even more sprawling and ambitious, I think, than that ended up being. So, yeah. Excellent. And it comes out in um, next month, May. So May, the graphic novel comes out, and then we also did a standalone 24-page story for the free comic book day this year. Awesome. Yeah, so Image's free comic book will be a Bone Orchard, uh, a, another unique standalone story that will only be available there. So those two books together will kind of be the gateway into this this new world. And is Sor did Sorrentino do the yeah, free comic book? Do all, everything Bone Orchard will just be the two of us. Yeah. Wonderful. That's the great. Stewart, of course, is going to call her Andrea, so that's... Very cool. Well, there you go, man. So yeah, free comic book day, and then also uh, a couple weeks later, man, boom, uh, pass the passageway. Yeah, pretty cool. Excellent. Very, very nice, man. And then also you got uh, Nguyen, and you are back, and uh, you, you, little monsters. And I appreciate you letting me see this as well. Yeah, um, pretty cool. And this is uh, a bunch of kids, uh, kind of a post-apocalyptic world. Again, I'll let you kind of uh, lead me in terms of how you want to describe this series. Yeah, I mean, really, the the thing that the high concept I was kind of working on was I had reread uh, Lord of the Flies sometime a couple of years ago for whatever I don't know. I came back, I read it in high school, and it always stuck with me. It's a great book, right? And uh, I went back to that, and I was kind of poking around, and um, I don't know. We had some conversation about vampires at some point. Me and a couple of their comic book creators were just joking around about some vampire thing. 
And I just I had this idea of these, what if you did Lord of the Flies, but with child vampires. And uh, and then the thought was, well, how would you get these kids, these child vampires alone? And it seemed like, what if they outlasted the rest of humanity? And these are like the last kids on earth. And they're, they're kind of stuck forever as children. And uh, and this was sort of the, the, the genesis of the book. So yeah, it really is. The, it's kind of these, uh, I can't, I don't know how many kids there are, eight kids or whatever. They're the last kids on earth and they're stuck forever in this sort of state of childhood and wonder together with, well, until something of course happens to shake that and to sort of drive a divide through them. So just like your kid in uh, black hammer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, or, or is there, or is there a difference? Because obviously she thinks of herself really as, as an old lady and everything, even though she's stuck being a child and, and you get a, you yeah, get a little bit you know, of out of that. Actually, that's pretty cool. I, the golden Gale character. Yeah. yeah. Stuck forever. Yeah. These kids, they're not, uh, it's kind of the opposite where she's, she's an adult or an older woman stuck in the body of a child. These, these, they're very much still children. They're fully innocent and they've maintained that for reasons that will be revealed. It's kind of part of the mystery of how, how are they trapped in amber like this? Why aren't, you know, why don't they remember all the hundreds of years they've lived and they kind of, and that, that's kind of all these questions led to the, me building the story out. But, um, yeah, these these kids are very much innocent still, you know, like they, they play tag and capture the flag and run through Los Angeles alone. And uh, and then, uh, of course, something has to happen to sort of, you know, kind of rip that innocence apart and, and kind of turn the kids against each other a bit in a Lord of the Flies kind of way. And yeah, and that's the series. Yeah. Well, also, and I mean, you can kind of tell a little bit here on the cover, but as you get into the interiors, it's really this black and white thing with slight accents of red and of course being vampires, you can. Understand. Yeah. I mean, me and Dustin had done, uh, you know, obviously we did descender and ascender for, uh, I can't remember how many years we worked on that together, at least five or five years or something, you know, and Dustin fully painted every issue of those books, which is really, I'm, sh I'm sure it must be so labor intensive. Uh, and I think when he, we got to this new story, it was a chance for him to break from that style and try some new things. And, and some of the books we had discussed, before we really even started working on it were were actually some manga that we both had read recently. Of course, there's the big ones like Akira and, and sort of those touchstones, which we both love, but then a couple others. And, uh, and I, Dustin, we didn't really plan it, but he just came at me with this style, this sort of black and white, slightly more manga S style uh, with these, these splashes of color. And uh, it, it immediately kind of was so striking. We just went with it. And uh, I think it, it looks great. I, I'm really loving what he's doing on those on the book for sure. And I think he's having a lot of fun too. So, And in, in both cases, you really let the artist kind of run free without dialogue for several, for several passages as well. And again, very effective. Uh, it, it, it underlines the bleakness, I think of the stories, but also uh, it gives you it gives your uh, storytellers a chance to do their stuff without any you know interruption. Yeah, I mean I, I love that stuff. I love quieter moments and letting them breathe. And uh, we don't do enough of it, especially in monthly comics, because you usually have to cram so much plot into a monthly comic. You can't just have pages and pages of silent kind of <laughs> tone poems going on. <laughs> but <laughs> that's the joy of image. We can do whatever we want, right? So yeah. Uh, you know, I just wanted it to feel naturalistic, you know, that just these, you know, just these kids being and just being with them in this environment and seeing, you know, and they're not always chatting with each other and throwing one liners at each other. You know, some some of it's just being being kids and kind of running around. And, and I wanted to kind of let the reader experience that a bit before things get too, you know, heck, you know, before the plot really kicks in. <clears throat> Understood. You know, I really appreciate you doing live because I think we're getting some really great uh, callbacks to old stuff of yours, plus other questions as well. And uh, I, I do want to get Simon in here who says, uh, and I know this for a fact, that you got to meet Gord uh, Downey while working on Secret Path. And uh, do you have any stories that you can share? What a great book, man. And oh, Thank uh, you. Man, a wonderful project. Absolutely. And all that is music as well. Uh, this guy Barton. actually has my last name, Simon Lemire, this, this, this question. I suppose so. Yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> I did get to meet Gord Downey. I got to become really good friends with him, actually. So uh, that book came out in 2016, but we started working on it in late 2013. So I knew it for, you know, we worked on it for a couple of years together, um, and he would come here to my studio. He didn't live far from here. 
and he'd come, you know, once a week, once every other week, and we'd sit and go through what I'd done. And, you know, it was all based on his lyrics. We didn't really have a script or anything. So that was interesting, drawing a comic from from song lyrics rather than a script. You know, it was much more open to interpretation and not so linear, you know, it, it, and uh, that was really cool. And so sometimes he'd come and he'd kind of walk through the lyrics and he wouldn't always tell me exactly what he was thinking, you know, but he'd give me enough or a few images, you know. Um, and yeah, we became real close. Um, and then, of course, he got sick and, and that was um, that was very emotional to be doing such an emotional story to begin with. But then to have it all tied in with Gord's own illness and, and his death and everything was, you know, really hard, but also a really special thing to be a part of. So. Yeah, um, I don't know if I have any specific stories, you know, uh, but uh, I keep those to myself because our friendship was pretty important to me. But yeah, he's he was a great guy. I was well, I, yeah, and I think even what you just said gives us a good glimpse into the collaboration. You know, I was just talking with someone about uh, vinyl and and uh, digital, and uh, that's the great thing about Secret Path is uh, that you did release it as vinyl as well, yeah. and it and it uh, and your art even lent it to um that wonderful experience with vinyl being old i remember it quite well and then people that are new with vinyl as well where you just play the music and you you put the album up and you just stare at the art and everything and it really yeah, i miss that too with albums yeah. you know especially the whole spotify era you really do lose that feeling of uh appreciating album art and album covers and everything you know i love yeah. that so it's cool to do that stuff and um and even when we did the comic we did it we didn't do the size of a normal comic. We did a 12 by 12. So, you know, a square like. The, yeah, absolutely. The same, the same dimensions as an album, which was cool to do. Just kind of just sometimes just those little changes kind of can create cool, creative opportunities and kind of inspire you. So here, uh, hook, Hooked on uh, Juno uh, says late to the party. But have we talked about Green Hell yet? No, we haven't. Uh, so please talk about Green Hell. Yeah, I mean, I've always, I don't have a lot of DC and Marvel stuff left that I really am itching to do. You know, I got to do a lot of stuff, but I never really got to do a good Swamp Thing story, you know, I, I and he's my favorite. So um, I got to play around with him a little bit when I did Animal Man yes, you know, as a guest star and stuff. But uh, yeah, you and Snyder uh, kind of did some stuff together on, on, on sure, that. Yeah, and that was fun, but I never really got to sink my teeth fully into it the Swamp Thing character. So the the DC Black Label imprint or whatever you call it gave me the opportunity to do scratch a few itches before I went fully creator owned. And one of them was the question with Dennis Cowan, which was like a dream come true. And then uh, outstanding. Yeah, I had to do a Swamp Thing story and I had to work with Doug Mankey. Those were the two things. So it all kind of came together. And I mean, just working with Doug is the best. So he's oh, God. one of my all time favorite artists. One of the first pieces of original art I ever bought was a Doug page, you know, and uh, so it's just more than anything. I'm just so into working with Doug, but, and also getting to tell a Swamp Thing story is, is great. And I wanted to tell a story that stood on its own, um, but also tied a little bit into the animal man and Swamp Thing stuff that Scott and I had done in the new 52, you know, so it, it does act as a bit of a coda to that. Um, That's awesome. Much the first issue, but as we get into issue two and three, uh, spoiler, but one of the Baker family will will return from the Animal Man run that I did. So that's going to be really fun. Um, that's great, man. That's outstanding. So yeah, and uh, uh, Hooked on Juno says they just finished Animal Man, so he's excited to see where you go with Swamp Thing. And yeah, the, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the question. I was certainly going to mention it as well. Uh, that was terrific. And uh, yeah. did, did you, did, did, I mean, I'm trying to remember the timing because I know we lost Denny O'Neill uh um you know, I don't know the timing on that too i think i had already i think the book was almost done to be honest did you ever have a chance to meet him and ever talk about the question no. with him we talked to dennis cowan a lot sure about, about denny but not i didn't get to meet dennis uh denny get the yeah denny and dennis denny and dennis yeah, yeah. uh tongue twister but um so no, I never did, unfortunately. A huge respect, oh. obviously, for him and everything and for what he did with that character. And I tried to honor their run as much as I could with that. But uh, that's one of those projects, that question story, that I never could have planned on that being a happening, you know, or, or being a thing. It just kind of came out of a conversation with with Dan DiDio talking about some stuff I could do with uh, Black Label and, and questions a character I love because of their run, because of the oh, – and, yeah. And Dan, when I said that, Dan said, well, you know, 
Dennis always wants to is always wanted to go back to question. We've just been trying to find a story, and and then that was all I needed. So <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, Jesus Christ, no, and uh, you know, Sinkevich didn't Sinkevich ink uh, yeah. Dennis. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Yeah, what the a dream. Best. Yeah, absolutely, man. Oh, Andrew wants to know. Uh, he he loves all the art uh, behind you and everything. Thanks. So yeah, let's uh, let's zoom in, and maybe you can yeah. tell some of your favorite it's pieces. Everywhere. It's everywhere, man. I got a problem collecting art from ah. artists I work with. So a lot of the stuff behind me is probably from books I've worked on. You know, where I've I've gotten things from different artists I've collaborated with. There's uh, what do I got over my shoulder? I got a Gabriel Walta. Well, I'm I'm reversed. That's a sentient page. Gabriel Walta. We got some Royal City covers. Outstanding. Um, yes. We got a George Perez, Jerry Ordway crisis page there. That's kind of my my prized possession. Oh wow! What uh, what uh, scene is it? That's fantastic. It is, what issue is it? I think it's issue eleven. Or no, no, it's issue five. Oh. When they all gather in the satellite. So that's uh, oh wow, <clears throat> that's a cool one. Uh, and then there's a Dave McKean Hellblazer there, right above my drawing desk. I'm, uh, I'm and uh, yeah, I got all kinds of stuff. And there's stuff in front of me here too. So <laughs> yeah, I got I got a problem with it, but it's <laughs> oh no, that's oh dude. No, I good for you. I I have my a few pieces. In fact, you mentioned Monkey. I have a, a Superman that Doug drew for me. Yeah, uh, I got a Frankenstein page right over there. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's right. Did he did he draw your Frankenstein? Uh, he did some did covers. No, oh, uh, but okay. I, I I was in love with that book. So when stuff came when it came time to pitch stuff for the new Fifty Two, I pitched a kind of taking over the Grant Morrison uh, Doug Mankey swamp. Uh, Frankenstein character and they went for it. So, so Doug did some covers for that, which was cool. That's excellent, man. No. And uh, I was I, on the one hand with the new 52, I was bummed that the uh, justice society continuity went away, but I love the solution of uh, it was uh, Frankenstein and his uh, squad that kind of replaced them as <laughs> uh, the world war two uh, heroes. And stuff. Yeah. I mean, flashpoint was a flashpoint in new 52. That stuff was kind of hit and miss, you know, now looking back a decade or so later, like some of it was, I miss, but then there were a few things that really worked, and I think one. Luckily, one of the things that really worked was the, the Animal Man and Swamp Thing stuff that I did with Scott. Seems to keep finding an audience, which is cool. And then I, one of those sort of uh, cult books that get, doesn't get talked about as much, but people really like, was the Frankenstein one, and I, I certainly had fun writing that one too. Absolutely, uh, Deviant Prod uh, says you've written what is often considered, and he agrees as the best Moon Knight run. Indeed. What uh, for you made it special, and what state of mind did you get into it? <laughs> um, I mean, of all the stuff I did at Marvel, it's definitely my favorite thing. Um, and the, what state of mind did I get into? I just tried to, I tried to make it a real exploration of of mental health and of of you know the <clears throat> the multiple personalities that that Moon Knight, the character, kind of already had in the previous incarnations, that, right from the beginning with Sienkiewicz and Doug Manch. And, yeah. um, so I tried to I tried to create a narrative that honored all the previous incarnations that other creators had done and, and kind of used the multiple personalities as, as a way of giving props to those, and you know, to those different runs and different versions of the character, but then also just do a serious exploration of what it what that would be like. And uh, and about sort of how our flaws and our, you know, can also make us stronger and make us special, and uh, and and trying to tell a story about that with that character and be respectful of it. And uh, I mean, I love, it's such a he's such a cool character. I, I I've seen the first episode of the show, the new show, which is is pretty good. So we'll see where it goes from there. But yeah, I, I love I loved writing that book for sure. That's great, man. No, you know, uh, Deck and. Uh... Warren and you and Bendis mm -hmm. and I got to say, uh, modern modern Moon Knight has uh, been served quite well with uh, the various creators. Yeah, it's weird. There's a few characters for whatever reason that always seem to draw these great runs by creators. Uh, there's something about the character that brings out the best. You know, Daredevil seems to do that with people. You know, there's all these great Daredevil runs, and, and Moon Knight as well brings out these little great gems from from creators. It's uh, it's a very fruit. You know, a very uh, the character there's just a lot to mine there and a lot to get into. And uh, he's really rich. Yeah. I really loved what Jason did with him too. In uh, his Avengers arc, 
where um, I don't haven't read it, so I, I I wouldn't I don't know, but I, I trust you. I like Jason, so I'm sure it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Absolutely, man. Oh, uh, Cycle Cleveland would love if you uh, did a tour. You should do this sometime. Maybe a Substack. Uh, tool the camera around yeah, it. I think I have done it. Yeah, I, I've done it on my Substack once. If you go back in the archives, where I've gone okay. through a lot of the art, but it's probably need, I probably need to update it because I keep it keeps changing and growing in here. So. Um, I'll do it again sometime or I'll put some on my Instagram. That's great, man. Do you, uh, now that, well, actually we don't even know because again, every month it changes, but it seems like we're coming out of COVID slowly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Things are slowly returning to normal here in Canada as well. So are, are you um, going to do any cons or, uh, well, this year because of the, we'll be shooting the Essex County show from August to September. And then I'll be in post-production for the rest of the year. So, this year is kind of out, unfortunately. I am itching to get back, you know, traveling a bit and, and doing cons. So it would be more like, um, probably more like 2023 where I get back doing a few shows. Okay. I understand, man. Uh, having a great conversation with Jeff Lemire. I'm going to take a very quick break to acknowledge uh, one of our sponsors. And we'll come right back with more with Jeff right here on Word Balloon. conversation with jeff lemire here on word balloon uh nice acknowledgement from mark mcgrath who says you're on fire knocking him out of the park your name on a book means you could buy with confidence that's very good that's like uh that's like buying insurance absolutely another reason to be a proud canadian absolutely so thanks man. Uh, and he's from labrador cool thanks mark i appreciate that yeah i try to put everything i got into all my books so i'm glad you're responding to what i'm doing Hey, man, I'm so glad when you were mentioning the stuff on the walls, you mentioned Royal City. Uh, I, I Again, I, I know that was a real passion project for you, and I really loved it. And, and I don't know if that's something you might ever return to in some form. Pages two and three of volume two right there on the drawing board, John. Nice. <clears throat> Fantastic year, man. That's great. Great. Wow. It's going to be good. I'm super excited. I got a, like a story I'm really excited about. It's going to. Probably take me a couple of years to get it out there, but uh, it's I'm working on it. So yeah. that's cool. you know, honestly, man. If uh, if this were another uh, time, I could see that being almost a newspaper strip and everything in terms of <laughs> it's the, the the well, you know, yeah. I mean, it just the, that it is. It's kind of like that's your soap opera. It seems real. Safe. Yeah, in a way, I, these characters in this family that I can kind of return to and and stuff. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited. It took me a couple of years to find another angle in and another story i wanted to tell with them but i am I'm, I'm pretty excited now about it so great to hear man that's outstanding uh double m wants to know um regarding your new horror universe and that's as you say it's you and andreas uh but will you have uh plans to invite other creators involved or uh is it just you guys so everything in the bone orchard mythos will be just andrea and i there'll be no one else so we'll do every project just the two of us with dave stewart coloring um yeah this isn't like black hammer where we kind of spun off into different things and had different artists and whatnot this is all going to be a singular vision <clears throat> by the two of us i understand <laughs> cycle cycle cleveland says uh royal city is here for better or worse there you go <laughs> uh, excellent canadian uh, comic strip right is it uh, yeah. better for us yeah Outstanding. Absolutely, man. You see, I'm, I'm much more 
hip to Canadian comedy versus uh, versus you know uh, well and again actually you know I I know well I know my comic books not my my comic strips for for yeah. Canadian comic strips but uh, that's awesome man too goddamn funny and uh, Henry wanted to know how it feels uh, to return to Sweet Tooth all 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 these years later the comic specifically yeah yeah that was good I mean. Um... I had gone to the set, obviously, of the when they were shooting season one, and got sure. really kind of fired up again about the world of Sweet Tooth from that experience and seeing, kind of seeing it again through other people's eyes and and remembering why I loved it, you know, when I was doing it because you kind of get burnt out by the end of whatever projects, and that one was uh, a four year odyssey, so <clears throat> I was pretty burnt on it, but sure. Um, yeah, it was cool to go back and it was especially cool. It was the early days of the pandemic when I started working on that one. And, um, you know, there's like with everyone, there's all this uncertainty about what that was going to mean and what that was, you know, going to how it was going to change our lives and everything. And uh, having sort of this comfort of the going back to a world I knew and this character that I knew was a nice way to kind of keep me sane during the, the first few months of that. Because it was like uh, it, there was some comfort in going home there and playing with, and being with those characters each day and it kind of gave me a uh you know an escape that i needed from reality a little bit so yeah it was good no i think that's the last time you and i talked was right at the beginning of the pandemic and it wasn't uh, really yeah uh, yeah and i mean uh no and i and i know hey it was tough for all of us and everything mm -hmm. with essex county being made into a series might we see a return from a comic standpoint to essex county no i don't think so that's a that i feel like that story was done um, I guess when did I, 20, 2006, so 2006, 2007. So, I mean, I was a different person when I did that and I don't think, sure. I could, you know, and, uh, I, I feel like Royal city is more, it's almost, it's the same kind of stories, but it's just more my perspective now. So if it's pretty close to what a return to Essex would be, you know, and, um, yeah, I don't want to mess with the stories. It's, it's so well respected and by so many people now that story that, um, <clears throat> you kind of just want to leave it alone. No, I understand, man. And you're right. I could see kind of the spiritual yeah. connection between Royal city and, and Essex and everything. So yeah, yeah. definitely. Wow. I've, I've, I've opened a can of worms for cycle. Now he's like, uh, do you have a, uh, do you draw a lot of inspiration or have a love for newspaper strips at all? No, not really. I mean, uh, when I was growing up, I read boom County. I liked that one a lot. Sure. His cartooning was really cool. Um, and, but other than that, I never really connected that much with newspaper strips. It was always comic books for me, you know, growing up and, uh, I can respect them now, sort of, I can, you know, looking at them, you know, but I, there was never any that really hooked me emotionally or, 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 you know, I was, if for me, it was always comic books. Chris Somni and I always bond about talking about, uh, comic strips, old comic strips. Oh yeah. How much we love them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, now you mentioned Boone County, and I was going to ask in general, as I was mentioning, uh, you know, I, well, I was telling you off the air, you know, getting to talk to uh, Dave Thomas and SCTV, and I'm a big uh, Ken Finkelman fan, all of his uh, sure. comedy and stuff. What makes you laugh? I, we, we, You know, again, I, I, I love uh, the dark places we go to with you, but yeah, would you ever, you know, what, what, what? What kind of comedy do you like? Uh, yeah, I've always been a bit of a comedy nerd. You know, ever since I was a kid, I was always into SCTV and, and Kids in the Hall was big when I was yes when I was at the right age. You know, growing up, so that was that, sure. that's a big one for me. I was actually watching old episodes of Mr. Show this morning while I was drawing. So there you go. Um, yeah, I, I love all that stuff. You know, um, I'm big. Uh, you know, the the early days of Saturday Night Live were were awesome. And of course, uh, yeah. So, yeah. All right. Nika wanted to know, uh, and and this is an interesting question, and I know I've asked this as well of Matt Kent. Did you have any pushback on your more art, abstract art style when you were beginning as a cartoonist? No, because we didn't come up in mainstream comics, you know, where there was a sort of a set style or whatever. Um, we were really in indie comics where you just, it was very personal, very idiosyncratic, stylized work that everyone was doing, and so it just suited it, it suited our that world, you know, where people were more open to different art styles than with maybe traditional superhero comics or whatever. And so we'd already kind of established our voice in that way, both Matt and I, before we ever got anywhere close to working for one of the bigger companies. Um, and then we just kept doing it. And 
you know, it's our our art is what it is. We draw how we draw, you know, and you either either love it or you hate it. But uh, you know, we're not going to draw any other way. It's just who we are. Have you seen comparisons to the independent community in Canada versus the American independent community? Is there more? Is the do you feel like there's more? Uh, I don't even know camaraderie or whatever, or, you know, or maybe not. It's, you know, yeah, no, I don't think so. I feel like, um, not for me anyway, I, I the, the sort of community I found were all from the States for, for whatever reason, when I started, oh. doing, you know, I, I didn't really connect with a lot of Canadian cartoonists or comic artists until late until more recently. Uh, I, I was always traveling to the States with top shelf and stuff. And I, you know, I would meet people like Jeffrey Brown and Matt Kent and Nate Powell, you know, and we became sort of a, a little, a little community, a little family there. Uh, and it wasn't until later that I, you know, I met people like Chip Zarsky and some other, some other guys that are hanging around here. Um, so yeah, it just, that was just my circumstances though. I was being published by top shelf. So I, obviously those were the people I, I started to meet when I was first getting into comics. No, there you go, man. No, it's great. I, you know, I, right now I gotta, I, Max gotta be the one that I gotta talk to, uh, uh, that I haven't talked to in a while because yeah, I just had Jeffrey on with his, uh, Batman and Robin. And oh, nice. uh, I forget the, uh, the third guy, but, uh, yeah. the Robin's friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Um, oh, I gotta find it. Cause, uh, someone had, um, asked a point about, or actually wanted to know, or told him, Someone said something about how uh, much he loved your Batman and Robin run and oh, your yes. interpretation of Dick Grayson. Yeah. And I am curious. Tell me, tell me your uh, point of view on Dick Grayson. Um, that that story kind of had a long gestation period as well, where that was something I pitched uh, to Black Label before Black Label was ever really a thing when they were still just talk first starting to talk about it behind the scenes. Uh, I pitched it as something I would write and draw myself. So I just tried to do a, I come up with a, a Robin story that was really, um, it, where Batman was sort of secondary in a lot of ways. It was really from his perspective of this boy who was still grieving the death of his parents and uh, and the the man he gets, you know, whose orbit he gets kind of sucked into happens to be this guy who was also kind of permanently grieving the, the, his parents. And how it was this crossroads for Dick Grayson that we show in the series where he can either fall into Batman's shadow completely and, and kind of become another Batman, uh, who, this sort of dark brooding <laughs> character, or he could, he could take his grief and his, you know, the experience and, and kind of learn to become something different than Batman and, and thus Robin is born. Right. And uh, so, yeah, it's a very simple story, but it just tried to really charge it emotionally with that and, uh, and just show what a dick Batman is really. Cause <laughs> that's, well, that's interesting because also um, you could argue that uh, this is where Bruce does succeed is that no, he doesn't want, at the end, uh, yeah, it comes yeah, Dick to, yeah. you know, follow it's a journey for both of them, right? And uh, and clearly, the only level headed adult in the room is Alfred, as always. So. And I was gonna say, exactly, it's Alfred. I mean, or is it Alfred that like kind of comes in and says, Don't He's let both child of their fathers whether they know it or not. So, yeah, <clears throat> I love it, man. No, that's that's you see, again, that's that's why writers in the right hands you know it's like well what more what new thing can you say about batman or robin or alfred or whatever and it's like oh no 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 they're, they're you know put it in the put them in the right hands and the same goes for swamp thing and everything that's great is is it an alec holland story is your uh it is an alec holland yeah yeah which was really cool to do that and constantine gets a nice juicy role as well and uh so yeah it's it's fun that's outstanding very cool man uh well, I what else? Uh, you know, what else can we talk about? Is there is there anything else on the horizon that we haven't uh, covered? No, really, really. I think you know uh, it's you know the bone bone orchard stuff with Andrea and little monsters, yeah. and then I'll have a, the book with Walta in this fall, and and then this new Royal City stuff that I'm drawing. But who knows how long until that is actually sees the light of day? I'm just starting it, so those are the comics projects, and then the TV stuff is is also a uh, now a thing that I'm kind of focusing on a little more this year because of the show so what's your uh what's your sub stack uh, address for people who want to subscribe it is i have no idea because it's probably just 
Substack slash Jeff Lemire. I don't know. I don't okay, know. Go on my Twitter or Instagram and you can find it through those. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> That's all right, man. Well, no, and you know, I know you flirted with, um, or I should say, a publishers have flirted with you, and you've, you know, you like Walter. What was that through? That was was that TKO? Yeah, that was a TKO project. Yeah, yeah. And there was a period after DC and Marvel exclusivity where I wanted to try out different things, you know. So I did a lot of stuff for Dark Horse, a lot for Image, but then I also did a few things here and there. And that TKO project was was a lot of fun, and obviously. Um, it introduced Walter and I and kind of got yeah. us in together, which was the best part of it. So that's cool. Dini dude wants to know any uh, word on a reprint of cosmic detective. It's coming. We've had due to the supply chain stuff, the paper stuff, the yeah. public, you know, it's nothing we can do about it. It's been in line at the printers for months. Uh, I, I believe July is when the, when it finally is going to ship out to backers. So I think July, let's fingers crossed that that will finally be printed and sent to whoever backed it. So, very cool, man. And uh, Psycho Cleveland says he's happy to hear more Royal City is uh, going to be in the near future. Oh, awesome. Or eventual future, I should say. Cool. So, beautiful, Jeff. That's awesome. I, uh, As always, great to see you. Great to hear from you. Um, I hope things normalize so that I, I eventually do want to get up to Canada and see a couple shows and stuff. And I know, as you said, you're going to be busy this year with Essex County and everything. Mm -hmm. We understand that. But uh, yeah, I hope to I hope to see you face to face soon. It's yeah, that would be great. I hope I'll get traveling again next year. I hope, and uh, that'll be that'll be cool. Beautiful. Well, as always, thank you, and uh, everybody. Remember, uh, coming up uh, next month, first of all, free comic book day, which will give you uh, the introduction to uh, Jeff and uh, Andrea's uh, new uh, horror world. But we've yep. got uh, the passageway to look forward to, and then from uh, Dustin Nguyen and uh, and uh, Jeff, uh, it's Little Monsters from Image. And when does uh, Little Monsters hit? The first one shipped last month. So I think issue two comes out this week, I think. There you go. Excellent, man. And, of course, uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> no worries, bud. It's all good. Uh, last Days of Black Hammer. Uh, that's going to be great. And uh, also uh, covering uh, – you're doing it on Substack too, right? Yeah, that's right. That one's on Substack. It'll come out in print eventually from Dark Horse from when it's done being serialized on Substack. Beautiful, man. Well, be well and we'll talk soon and i'm, I'm glad you made time for me and i'll let you get that call yeah thanks man all right, all right buddy take it easy Good jeff Ramirez, everybody i hope uh you enjoyed the conversation with jeff and uh, i thank you for watching today uh more great stuff with word balloon uh, later today uh talking to alex segura about his brand new novel secret identity uh it's terrific and i'll get my hair uh you know, under control uh by that time too until then everybody